The most reliable commentator on the environmental stewardship front in the world, and he and his compatriots are responsible for most of the ideas in this piece. But first, a bit of an introduction. We have a responsibility to ensure that our short-term activities do not compromise our futures by, for example, compromising the viability of the natural systems we all depend upon. But Dr. Lomberg is no careless activist. Quite the contrary, he has done more than anyone else to examine the multitude of problems that confront us on the environmental front while simultaneously taking into account economic necessity, the moral and practical responsibility we have to provide people with, for example, education, opportunity, and security. Dr. Lomberg and the experts in his group have conducted very careful cost-benefit analysis of a number of projects deemed by a variety of global leaders to be in the world's best interest. And they have rank-ordered such approaches by return on investment. In other words, they have attempted to determine where we might spend our money on improving the lot of the poor, to take a prime example, and do the most good in the most efficient manner possible. And that efficiency, far from being a mere practical and cold-hearted consideration, is precisely what increases the chances that any good at all will actually be done, which is a very difficult thing to manage, and that simultaneously allows us to do more good as we conserve more resources to do so. The requirement for such an analysis seems self-evident, although it is rarely done. The utility of all spending needs to be assessed regardless of amount. And that is particularly true when billions or even trillions of dollars are at stake and the fate of the very economies that sustain us hang in the balance. We are all confronted with a constant story about the catastrophe that faces the planet, particularly on the carbon front. It is simpler and in some sense more immediately morally rewarding to reduce the complexity of planetary management to the need to reduce our so-called carbon footprint. But the plain truth of the matter is that a multitude of troubles beset us, both economically and environmentally. We therefore require people like Dr. Lomberg to think about many issues simultaneously to produce a plan and to help us move forward in the most beneficial manner possible. I would recommend that those of you who are truly interested in such things familiarize yourself with his work. You could start with The Smartest Targets in the World, which is a summary of the Copenhagen Consensus think tank's attempt to prioritize our action and attention in the world on the economic and environmental front. And with that, we'll turn our attention to the aforementioned Telegraph article and discuss how those who hypothetically lead us are failing to save the planet at this year's UN Climate Change Conference, known as COP27. Why 27? Because this is literally the 27th time that such a group has been convened. And as you will soon see or hear, very little has been accomplished and much time and money wasted in consequence. Global carbon dioxide emissions have kept increasing since the world's nations first committed to rein in climate change at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. Despite dozens of climate summits and the global climate agreements struck in Kyoto and Paris, this is the case once again in 2022, when we will collectively set a new emissions record while rich countries increasingly promise draconian cuts and then generally backtrack as they import huge amounts of oil, gas and coal to save their citizens from energy poverty as they have done most recently to address the current energy crisis. Most of the future emissions will come from the currently poorer countries in Asia and Africa as they power their climb out of abject poverty. In the previous 10 years, the world has focused more on remediating climate change than ever before. Despite this, we're not achieving anything, although no shortage of money has been wasted. In a surprisingly honest review of climate policies, the UN revealed a lost decade. The report found that it couldn't tell the difference between what has happened and a world 
that adopted no new climate policies since 2005. Consider that. All those climate summits and grandiose promises, all that expense and trouble, and no measurable difference whatsoever. This state of affairs is unsurprising, unfortunately, because today's renewable energy sources have two big problems. First, they occupy a vast amount of space, often displacing nature. Replacing a square yard of gas-fired power plant requires 73 square yards of solar panels, 239 square yards of onshore wind turbines, or an astonishing 6,000 square yards of biomass. One study found that the United States would have to devote a land area four times the size of the United Kingdom to clean power to fulfill President Biden's promise of a carbon-free economy by 2050. Second, and of even greater importance, the two renewable energy technologies favored by the vast majority of environmental activists are intermittent or unreliable. Solar energy simply isn't produced when it's overcast or nighttime. Wind energy requires a breeze. We're often told by green energy boosters that wind and solar energy are cheaper than fossil fuels. At best, that is only true when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. On a windless, dark night, the cost of wind and solar power rises to the infinite. It is for such reasons that it is deeply misleading, although highly convenient, to compare the energy costs of wind or solar to fossil fuels only when it is windy or sunny. It is also important to note that since all solar energy is sold at essentially the same time, when the sun is up and shining, its value drops dramatically. When solar reaches 30% market share in California, for example, as one study revealed, it loses two-thirds of its value. Furthermore, because modern societies require 24 hours of non-stop power, backup is not optional. And that means reliance on fossil fuels when there's no sun or wind. As more sun and wind is introduced, more fossil fuel backups become ever more expensive as they offer their services for fewer hours to produce the necessary return on capital. And what are batteries? Globally, we have battery storage with current capacity to store one minute and 15 seconds of the world's electricity consumption. And that problem will not be ameliorated soon. Even by 2030, global batteries will only cover less than 11 minutes of the global electricity consumption. And all of this just shows the problems with moving electricity away from fossil fuel. When Biden promises ambitiously that all of America's electricity will come from renewable sources by 2035, he is addressing the comparatively simple part of the climate challenge. Electricity constitutes just 19% of total energy use. We're far further behind in developing solutions for agriculture, manufacturing, construction, and transportation. Of these, the latter, transportation, is most often discussed by environmentalists and virtue signaling politicians who insist that a solution is already at hand, electric vehicles. Despite massive subsidies, however, just 1.4% of cars globally are electric. And that number is not rising quickly. The Biden administration itself estimates that battery electric cars will make up less than 10% of total U.S. automobile stock by 2050. The scenario for the entire world is that less than one-fifth of all global cars will be battery electric by 2050. We should remember as well that we simply do not yet have electric tractors or heavy trucks or airplanes or ships.